Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Hey, I love Easter, and here's the crazy thing about Easter. It's no secret what we're going to talk about. Uh, Jake and I were talking this last week. We were doing our uh, Thursday morning video, and as we were talking, I told him we needed to get wrapped this up because I needed to get my sermon written, and he joked with me. He said, hey, you already know what's going to happen. It's Easter. You already know the story. But, you know, here, here's why I love Easter for real, because I think Easter is a perfect time. It's a perfect day for you to consider becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. It's the perfect thing, day to do that. In fact, the other thing I love about Easter is I know some of you kind of have both feet on the brake when it comes to Jesus and kind of both feet on the brakes when it comes to these things of God. And, and yet you're tuned in over the last couple of weeks because this whole COVID thing has kind of got you freaked out and it's like, what in the world's going on? And, and so you were pumping the brakes a few weeks ago, but now you're kind of listening in a little bit. And here's what I want to say to you this morning. I know some of you, you're tuned Dan, you're listening, but for you guys that are kind of pumping the brakes a little bit on Jesus, I want to say this. I want to challenge you to think about becoming a Christian today in spite of the fact that you know some, in spite of the fact you used to work for one, maybe you're married to one, that you grew up with a bunch of them, that you think we're all a bunch of hypocrites. And by the way, newsflash, we are. <laughs> in spite of the fact of your bad church experience, and even if that's your experience, I want you to consider Maybe today, becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, even though you've had pain in your life, God didn't answer your prayers the way you thought he should, or he didn't perform the way you thought he could. And even though you lost your mama, and she loved Jesus, and you can't imagine why God would take your mama away from you, even that today, in spite of all those questions, and even the questions I can't answer, I would ask you today, I would like for you to consider, just maybe, just maybe today, on this Easter Sunday, becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. You see, here's the good news. Here's the good news, and I love this, that the church is going to survive COVID-19. Did you know that? The church is going to survive because the foundation of Christianity is not Christians. It's not the behavior of Christians. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. It's not even the foundation of the faith. It's not gathering physically. It's here we are in an empty room speaking to you online, on television today, that, that the foundation of Christianity is not a large gathering of people. The foundation even isn't even answered prayer. It isn't having all your questions answered because the foundation of our faith is what we celebrate on Easter. Easter addresses something that there's no other plausible explanation for that. Over 2,000 years later, there's still a group of people in the world, about 2 billion of them today in the world called the Church of Jesus Christ. And today on Easter, this is the day that explains it all. And here's what I mean by that. There's no plausible explanation for the church. There's no plausible explanation that we're even doing what we're doing today. In fact, I'm reading online that there's some quote-unquote church leaders saying the church will never be the same again, that 30% of the church is going to walk out of the church because of COVID-19. It's almost as they're rooting against the church. Can I just say this to you? There are millions and millions of people around the world today, about 2 billion people today on this weekend celebrating a Jewish carpenter that never went about 30 miles from his house that went public for about 
about three years of his journey, never wrote a book, never gave a speech that was recorded, never had a funeral. They haven't found his death certificate yet. And never, and over two billion people today are lifting up their hands, singing songs in languages you and I cannot understand all over this world. And there's no plausible explanation except for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's it. There's no other plausible explanation. And by the way, if you don't believe the church is going to survive after COVID-19, then I think you're smoking something and you need to put it down. Amen? I'm just going to say that. You know, there's a guy in the story, and we've told you this before, in the whole story of Christianity, there's this guy named Nero. You probably know that name. He used to feed Christians to lions. But most of you couldn't name one reform that he did all through the Roman Empire. And yet he's a footnote in this story today. There's a guy named Caesar Augustus, and we know that. We know this guy. In fact, we, you couldn't name one of the reforms he did for Rome, and, and you probably couldn't tell me anything about him unless you're a history teacher, but yet every single Christmas, every single year, that, that he, became, he has become a footnote in the story of Jesus Christ. And think about this, for over 300 years, maybe 400 years, the church, the, 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 after Jesus was crucified, almost 300 years, there was no Bible. There was no New Testament. Nobody got together, Brian, in a Sunday school class and said, turn to Mark, because there wasn't one. They didn't have them. No one stood in front of a camera like today and gave talks about the New Testament in fact, the phrase New Testament, first time it appeared, it was about 250 years after Jesus was crucified. So how in the world did the church survive all that the same way the church is going to survive all this today? It survived Rome. It survived Judaism that saw Christianity as a knockoff. Rome and Jewish authorities ganged up to stomp it out. There's no more Roman Empire, and there's no more, way more Christians than there are Orthodox Jews today. A third of the world believes in Jesus Christ, and yet a tiny handful of Jesus followers somehow survived the first century, somehow survived the Roman Empire, survived Judaism, and multiplied to the point that there were tiny little churches all around the Mediterranean rim. And 2,000 years later, that's why we're here today preaching to an audience bigger than we've ever preached before in our life about one thing that defines everything, and that is Jesus and the resurrection of his body. That changed everything. You see, when Jesus came onto the scene, he didn't do what men thought he should do. When Jesus came onto the scene, he didn't perform what he, they thought he should perform. In fact, one of Jesus' biggest problems with the religion movement is that Jesus had two problems. Number one, his mission was the problem. Jesus had a missional problem with people out there. He didn't do what the religious expected. He didn't do what he thought, what they thought he should do. You see, Jesus did not lead any kind of liberation or revolution. I'm going to liberate a group of people. And he, that wasn't his mission. He never even said, let's start a revolution. Let's turn over the status quo and let's do something new. No. Every once in a while, someone would try to kind of pit him against the government and Rome and all that. And, and Jesus' simple response was, hey, look, dude, give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to God what's God. And they said, now you talk about a kingdom, Jesus. A kingdom means you're going to reign, right? You're going to have this kingdom, right? You're trying to start a new kingdom, aren't you, Jesus? And here, I love Jesus would disappoint him. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, um, did I mention that my kingdom's not of this world? But did, did, I, did I mean, hey, Pilate, Pilate, you don't, need to, you don't need to be threatened by me. Rome, you don't need to be threatened by me. My kingdom's not even of this world. To the point that when Pilate tried Jesus on this holy week, and I hope you read that this last week in the second half of the book of John, that when Pilate came and he brought Jesus and he put him back, brought Jesus out to the people after they were yelling, crucify him, and, and they arrested him, and they turned him over to Pilate because they didn't want to be blamed for it. They wanted the Romans to be blamed for it. And Pilate comes back and he says, seriously, I can't find anything to accuse him of. There's nothing here. He's not introducing some new idea. He's not even coming after us can't find anything wrong with this man. The, Judea, the religious leaders in Judaism tried to trap Jesus 
And over and over again, Jesus would say, I'm not trying to overturn your law. I'm not trying to mess up what you're doing or your traditions. In fact, I'm here to keep the law, and you should keep the law, and no one should ever miss the law because the law came from God. Jesus never talked about rebellion. He never talked about liberation. He wasn't a revolutionary trying to introduce something. You see, the other problem with Jesus was not only his mission, is that Jesus never stopped talking about himself. He never stopped talking about himself. See, he didn't ask his followers to believe in his ideas. He didn't ask his followers to believe in these principles. If you live by these 12 principles, everything will go great. No, 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 he didn't do that. He didn't say put your trust in these revolutionary notions. Instead, he instructed his followers to put their trust in him. It's amazing. And there was a problem. That what makes the rise of Christianity absolutely unexplainable, except for the very thing that we celebrate this weekend, and that's the resurrection. There's this great story in Mark chapter 8, verse 27, and Jesus is talking to his guys outside of Caesarea Philippi, and they were having this conversation, and they were talking about the city, and Jesus says, hey, hey, we know who Caesar is, but who do people say that I am? And he's talking to his disciples. Who do people say that I am? Again, talking about himself. And this is important because Peter looked at him because he switched the question. He said, who do you say that I am? Now he's talking to his disciples, not, not who do they say I am, who do you say that I am? And Peter looks at him, and Peter says, I think you're the Christ, the Messiah. I think you're the son of the living God. And you know what Jesus didn't say? Hang on, Scooter, stop that, let's don't go too far. No, here's what Jesus said. This is amazing. He says, you're right. And not only are you right, Peter, you didn't come up with that on your own. God told you that. Jesus was always putting the focus on him as the son of God who came to take away the sins of the world. In fact, when Jesus first walked into the public eye, John the Baptist was baptizing at the the Jordan River. And we talked about this last week, that John the Baptist looks up, he sees Jesus, and here's what he doesn't say. Behold, there's a guy that's going to explain everything we need to know. Hey, there's a God that's going to give us the principles of everything we need to know. No. He looked at Jesus, and he said to the crowd, Behold, John 1, 29, the Lamb of God, who, that person right there, the Lamb of God, who comes personally to take away the sins of the world. It was all about Jesus, man. And the problem with Jesus' message was Jesus' message was not about ideas. It was about himself. He was the center of his own attention. It's amazing. He placed himself at the center of what he came to talk about. And the problem with Jesus is he kept talking about Jesus. He was the center. And so one day, he's having a conversation again with his guys about God and what what God's like and the Father. And it kind of gets confusing. And he just keeps going on and on. And finally, one of his disciples says, oh, Gigi, whoa, 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 stop. Just show us the Father. I mean, look, we're not following you. I mean, you're coming, you're going, we're going with you. We can't go with you this time. It's kind of getting a little confusing here, Jesus. Let's just stop. Just show us, God. Just show us the Father. And I love what Jesus said. Jesus goes, okay, let me give you another word picture. He doesn't say that. Jesus doesn't say that because here's what he says, and this is so amazing. John 14, 9. He says this, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Anyone that's seen me has seen the the Father. This is so important, especially if you've dissed Christianity or you've walked away or you're pumping the brakes. You see, some of you don't have an audience anymore to, to, to spew all the things you don't believe about Christianity, and finally you're stuck at home to think of with your own thoughts. And so this is so important. This is so important if you're listening today to listen and, and maybe you've walked away and maybe you're reconsidering and maybe you're kind of c- tuning back in. But listen to me, never once did Jesus say, never did any of his followers indicate that Jesus came to leave us with a collection of insights, a parables, and principles to pass on to the next generation. Never did Jesus say that. None of his followers ever indicated or even implied that the reason Jesus came was to leave us with some new teaching that we could pass on. The problem with Jesus was his message. It was not liberating a group of people. 
It wasn't revolutionary. He didn't try to launch something new. He didn't even try to overturn anything. He just kept talking about himself. <laughs> and listen, we said this last week. When Jesus died, you read this last Friday when Jesus died. Guess what? All the hopes, dreams, and everything died with him. Because when Jesus died, listen to me, there wasn't one Christian standing at the cross. There was none left. Our leader's dead. There was no one sitting there going, oh my gosh, our leader's dead. Let's get together and put all of his teachings together so this will go on. No, they lost hope. Because there's no teaching that would make any sense if Jesus is dead. None of his teaching makes sense if Jesus is dead. Because he was the movement. And when Jesus died, the movement died with him. He was the message. He was the center. It wasn't about principles and parables and ideas. It's about Jesus. In fact, it's so interesting that even before Jesus was crucified, his closest followers abandoned him. The very gods that, that we get the New Testament from, those guys abandoned Jesus even before he was crucified. And Peter, remember the one that says, you're the Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus said, bingo, God told you that. Even before Jesus is crucified, he's sitting by a fire and a, by a, fire and a little middle school girl comes along and she recognizes Peter. She cuts to looking at Peter and she looks across that fire and said, hey, aren't you one of those guys that follow? Aren't you one of those followers of Jesus? And Peter didn't say, yes, he's the Christ. You know what Peter said? You've got the wrong guy, girl. And she pushed him. And Peter pushed it even further. And he cussed her. He said, I don't know him. And totally denied him. And totally disbelieved it's amazing. Listen, when Jesus was arrested, they lost hope. They lost faith. And when he died, the movement died with him. There were no followers of Jesus after the crucifixion because messiahs don't die. And Jesus claimed to be a messiah. Sons of gods can't be killed. And Jesus claimed to be the son of the living God, the one and true God. Resurrection and life can't be crucified, amen? Doesn't make any sense. On more than one occasion, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. So how in the world, the big question is, how in the world after a man who so associated himself with a message was crucified, how in the world did that happen? I mean, how is it today that we're even still here, that two billion people still call his name and claims he's Lord? How is it that this crazy movement that died when he died, even survived the first century and will survive this little pandemic. Here's how it unfolded. Hopefully you read about it this last week in the second half of the book of John, Holy Week, early, early in the week. On the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Jesus had been crucified. And so they took Jesus' body and they wrapped the body up because it was about to be the Sabbath. And so they were in a hurry. And so they wrapped the body up and they prepared the body the best they could because they knew the Sabbath was coming and they knew they could come back and prepare the body later. And so they went and they put him in a borrowed tomb as quickly as they could because it needed to be done. And they knew it was going to have to be redone. So they quickly done that. And so the women show up after the Sabbath. After the Sabbath is over, they go to the tomb. And they go up to the tomb, and, and, and they're, they're walking up to the tomb, and, and they're probably thinking, I don't know how we're going to remove the stone. We need to get the body prepared. We need to do this right. We were in a hurry, and, and they were probably having this conversation, and probably a little bit in a hurry. And, and so they were trying to figure out how they were going to do it. And so on that first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene, remember, in the first century, women had no credibility. So don't miss this if you're out there and you're thinking that God doesn't care about women or the church has mistreated women. Listen, the church may have mistreated women, but God never did. So notice this story right here. Don't miss this. I'm telling you, this is huge for some of you that have a resentment towards man in the church. God has been represented by some sinful men. All sinful men represents God. But I want you to see this story. Don't miss this. This is huge. That in the first century, women had no credibility. 
In the first century, women could not appear and testify in court. That a woman's testimony was considered unreliable, and the fact that women were first in the were, were there first in the first century discredits the whole account of Jesus. But listen to this. Do you know why the gospel writers get this? Don't miss this. You know why the gospel writers tell us that women were the first people to discover the empty tomb? You want, you want to know the answer to that? It's real simple. Because women were the first people to discover the empty tomb. It's that simple. For so many women today who have a resentment towards the church, that ought to cause you to reconsider the story of Jesus, not what some church did 300, 200, even 1,500 years ago, but what Jesus did and who Jesus chose. I don't want you to miss this because women were just as important in the story as men. So early in the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, John, who's telling this as an eyewitness. Remember, John wrote all this down as an eyewitness so it would be reliable so that you and I may believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Mary Magdalene said in Luke 24, they, I don't know who they are, they have taken the Lord. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. Let me tell you why this is important. Because Mary Magdalene didn't go back running to the disciples and goes, guys, he rose from the dead. It never crossed her mind that he would rise from the dead. It never crossed her mind. This is big. They weren't standing outside the tomb with a countdown. There was no campfires, tents, bands, celebration, floats ready to go by. There was no body. The people who brought us the story of the resurrection honestly admit we thought that when he died, he'd stay dead because that's what most dead people do, right? So when the women found an empty tomb, they didn't assume a resurrection. They assumed somebody stole Jesus. And they went running back to the disciples and they said, somebody's taking the Lord. We don't know where he is. We don't know where they put him, but he's gone. Luke tells us how the men responded to this in Luke 24. But they, the men, they didn't believe the women. Because their words seemed like nonsense, you think? They listened to these women and they said, you're crazy. You went to the wrong tomb. It's nonsense, man. Come on. No wonder they don't let y'all testify in court, right? <laughs> so Peter and the other disciple, John, started running to the tomb in John 20. And John bent over when he got to the tomb, but he didn't go in. He just bent over and looked at the stripes and the linen laying there. You know why John didn't go into the tomb? Because it's a tomb, right? Then Simon Peter just came along beside him and just blew right past him, went straight into the tomb. And he saw the strips of linen laying there and the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. And finally, John gets the courage as Peter just rushes in, because that's just kind of Peter's personality, just rushes in. Then John gets the courage, and he steps into the tomb. And I love this in John 20, verse 8. He, John, saw and believed. He saw something. He saw something. He saw something that changed everything. Do you know when John, who spent three years with Jesus, finally believed it wasn't his teachings, it wasn't the miracles, it wasn't the crucifixion, it was an empty tomb. That's when he believed. You see, Jesus' followers re-engage the message of Jesus Christ. What I'm asking some of you to do today, I'm asking some of you to engage it for the very first time because Jesus' followers re-engage Jesus and the message of Jesus not because of a crafty message that he had, not because of the crucifixion of Jesus, although it was important that his body and his blood was broken and shed for us. Jesus' followers re-engage because of someone they saw. Jesus. They saw Jesus alive. And after Jesus rose from the dead, suddenly these men who unbelieved, these men who didn't expect a resurrection, all of a sudden, these men who went and hid, they suddenly went to the streets of Jerusalem and they began to preach and to teach. And they weren't preaching and teaching, hey, Jesus told this story one time and hey, Jesus gave this message one time. They weren't teaching the parables of the love or anything like that. They went into the streets of Jesus and they literally began to preach the Jerusalem and they literally began to preach 
preached to the very people that crucified Jesus. And, and they went straight to the people that were yelling, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And they went to him, not hundreds of days later, not hundreds of years later. This is just a few days after Jesus was crucified and died. And now he's risen again. They're going to those very people. And they're going, by the way, point number one, you killed him. Point number two, God raised him. Point number three, we've seen him. And point number four, now say you're sorry. Now that's good right there, isn't it? I mean, that was their message. You killed him. God raised him. We've seen him. Now repent of your sin and say you're sorry. Just simple. Peter said it this way. That guy, think about bold he is. This is Peter who ran, who denied knowing Jesus. The Peter who fled. The Peter who disbelieved. And he said this. He said, you killed. These are the men who were a part of the crucifixion he's talking to. He says, you killed the author of life, but God, isn't that a great two words, but God, raised him from the dead. And how do we know? Because we saw him. We saw him. And another message early on in those first few weeks, as they were gathering in the streets, they were talking about Jesus, that the people began to believe. They, they believed Matthew. I mean, they believed him. They believed Peter. They believed John. And finally, they just started going, listen, guys, what should we do? I mean, I hear what you say. Yeah, we did it. We killed him. Yeah, we did it. Now, what do we do? What do we do? You're right. And we believe you saw him. In fact, not only did you see him, there was 515 accounts of Jesus being raised from the dead. It's incredible. So what in the world do we do with this? And Peter simply replied, repent, repent, change your mind, change your mind, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. That was Peter's simple answer. What do we do? Repent. Repentance is changing your mind to think like God. Repentance is literally changing your mind from what you're doing now and starting to do what God wants you to do. So repentance is turning away from your sin. Every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and become a Christ follower. You see, this really is a great weekend for those of you who have never considered becoming a follower of Christ to become one. I'm telling you, Instead of depending on me or Summit Heights Fellowship, and I love reading your comments from all over. I love looking through those and seeing what you're, what you're getting out of what we're doing. But listen, we're, we're not it. Instead of depending on me or Summit Heights or, or instead of trusting in me or your mama or your girlfriend, can I just say this to you? Place your faith the whole way to your life on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And be saved. Because see, everything we do today is about him. Everything. Your weight, your faith on what Christ did for you. He loves you for the forgiveness of your sins. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the reason we're here today. How did the church survive? How did the movement begin? How did the movement move through the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth centuries? Why is it today that over 2 billion people are gathering around the world, even in social distancing, and they're celebrating the risen Christ? It wasn't because they thought we needed to get a book together. It wasn't because they thought that they needed to get his teaching in circulation because when Jesus died, there were no believers. The movement was dead. And what reengaged his followers, what changed everything, is that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. He came back to life. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ punctuates the point of the crucifixion, which is the forgiveness of sin. So here's what it means for us. It means if you're a Christian, your hope's not in vain. 
It means your hope is not in vain. That when Jesus said, he means I am the resurrection and the life. And you've heard me say this more than once through the years. And I'm going to say it again. But I'm just going to tell you this. If a man can predict and pull off his death and resurrection, then I'm just going to go with whatever he says. Amen? Because I've never met anybody else like that. I've never read anything about anybody else like that. There's not another person in history that's ever done that. That's what defines him. That's what defines our whole movement is the fact that he predicted he would die and he predicted he would only be dead for three days. And three days later, he arose and 515 people testify over nine ancient documents, both in and out of the Bible, back up that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I'm telling you, it's incredible. You see, we believe. And we believe because of something happened, and Jesus rose from the dead. And Peter and Andrew and James and John and Matthew and James, the brother of Jesus, hello. What would it take for you to believe that your brother rose from the dead and James believed that Jesus was the Son of God? Come on. So we believed, and we didn't believe, but then we believed again. Not because of what he taught, because of what he did. Because of what he did. He rose from the grave. And that's why, no matter how bad your church experience has been, no matter how crooked the last Christian you did business was, and, and you've called him and called her every name in the book, and no matter what you saw in your Christian home growing up, because your dad was a deacon and he did some pretty bad stuff, and your mama and all that stuff that you grew up with, and the stories you read and the offenses you've picked up from other people, no matter what you've seen in the terms of hypocrisy of the church, no matter how many unanswered prayers you've had or how disappointed you've been with God, I would say to you on this Easter weekend, you really should give Jesus another look. Give Jesus another look. Not because of what he taught, but first and foremost, because he claimed to have died for your sin. And nobody's ever claimed that. Nobody's ever claimed for that. When Buddha died, he said, I strive. When Jesus died, he said, it's finished. It's done. He died for you. But he didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave to conquer death and hell. And maybe today, you would engage or re-engage for the very first time. So here's what I want to do. If you've been on the fence and you've been on the sidelines and you've been thinking about it, you may have grown up in church. You may have grown up in another denomination. You, you may have walked the aisle at one time, but honestly, nothing changed. You just did it to get mama off your back. Amen? Well, maybe today there's something tugging at your heart, and I would tell you that's Jesus. He wants to save you. And so maybe today I would invite you, if you're considering, there's no better time than right now. I'm going to ask the band to come back, and we're going to sing one more song. But as they're coming back, I want to invite you to follow me in a prayer. And this prayer doesn't make you a Christian. It's simply expressing to God. It's going to be on the screen this morning. And maybe you're sitting there, and you're realizing you need a relationship with Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whosoever believes not in his ideas, not his teachings, not his revolutionary thoughts, whoever believes in him and trusts in him will not perish but have ever lasting life. And so if you're ready to do that deal, maybe you're sitting in your living room and your wife doesn't even know you're considering this. Your, your husband doesn't know. Your mom and daddy doesn't know. But you know there's something in your heart changing right now. And you're willing right now to pray this prayer with me. Man, it'd be a privilege to lead you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You ready? Heavenly Father, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe that when he died, he died for my sin. I believe that he rose from the dead and was seen. And in this moment, I place all my faith in his death on the cross as the payment for my sin. Come into my heart. Welcome me to your family. I love you. I'm grateful. And I want to spend the rest of my life as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look at me. If you prayed that prayer, if you prayed that prayer this morning, I would love to know who you are. In fact, there's going to be a link that's going to show up in your feed right now in Facebook and in YouTube. 
And if you're watching on our website, right to the right of that screen is my decision card. And I'd love for you to take just a few minutes this morning and fill that out. Maybe you wait till this afternoon and fill it out. That's okay. But we would love to pray with you. And we would love to help you begin your journey in following Christ. It's called discipleship. That is, we help you become a follower of Jesus Christ. So take a few minutes today. Fill out that decision card. Maybe you got a prayer request you forgot to put in earlier. You can use that decision card to put in a prayer request because we'd love to pray for you. But listen, we want to know about your decision today. Maybe today you re-engaged. Maybe today you've decided, you know what, all this COVID stuff, all these questions, I'm, I'm, I'm not pumping the brakes anymore. I'm all for Jesus. I'm going. This is the real deal, man. Listen, the church, I have no idea what the future holds, but I know this. The church has survived worse things than COVID-19. And I'm betting on the church because I'm betting on Jesus because he's already proven that he can pull off his death and resurrection. So I believe the church is going to be stronger than it's ever been. And we're going to see things that we've never seen before in our lifetime because he's still on the throne. He rose from the grave and he is our risen Savior. Amen? Amen. Let's sing together and we'll see you next week. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.